Our next speaker for the day is here to talk about interfacing design thinking and Scrum to deliver what customers really need. He's a senior consultant at Launch Labs and has a work experience of over 18 years. He's also a professional Scrum product owner and a Scrum master. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you, you all Mr. Tobias Wosowicki. And we also have a special guest with us today, Dr. Simon Springman, who's the managing director at Launch Labs. He's connected with us live right from Berlin. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Simon. Yeah, thank you very much for the warm words for the introduction. I warm, warmly welcome you as well to this presentation. I'm Simon, as mentioned before, Managing Director, Managing Partner of Launch Labs. Um, and you might remember my face from some of the charts um, of Ramesh's presentation just a few minutes before. It was a great project that we did together with Accenture in Bangalore, Bengaluru. And uh, this is actually uh, what we've done over the last years, uh, like last four to five years, uh, did a lot of project work in India. So I traveled India a lot like, I don't know, 15, 20 times. Uh, love India a lot, so unfortunately I cannot be there right now. Um, but yeah, we try this out via technology, via remote video conference, let's see. I hope uh, technology won't play tricks on us. And Tobias is there live um, and in person for any questions that you might have afterwards and to get in contact with us. So yeah, welcome to the presentation. Um, the title was already mentioned. Um, actually, the focus should be on customer experience, right? And customer needs. What do they really need? Um, so I try to figure out how with agile methodology, agile methods like design thinking and Scrum, we can solve this problem a bit better. And it is, believe me, a complex problem to really understand what, what customers want and what they need. Okay? So the flow of my presentation will be um, to answer three basic questions, it's like why, why Agile at all, is it necessary? We have other methods that work quite well over the last decades, why should we change anything at all? Second question is the what, what is design thinking actually all about? Yeah. And the third question is how, how can we combine design thinking on the one hand with other Agile methods like Scrum for example, that you might know. So this is kind of the flow of the presentation. Um, first of all, let's zero in into the why. Why Agile at all? And to make a long story short, in the end, the answer is because of the complexity of the world. The world has become much more complex than it used to be. And uh, there are several mega trends and let's say factors that are the reasons for this. First one is a no brainer. You can see this through all presentations you hear um, all over the world. First one is exactly the change through globalization. Yeah, this is of course true because um, the world has become a village and has become smaller. We travel much more. So there is a lot of change. And this change of course causes the need to adapt to change as an organization, to transform, and it's not easy. The second mega trend that I just want to highlight very briefly is, of course, the digitization. Yeah, you will hear this throughout all the presentations throughout the day, I guess, that digitization is one of the main reasons and factors. Uh, just because you can see the, the Paytm sign here, just one a little example. India's digital payment industries is estimated to hit one trillion US dollars by 2023, 1 trillion US dollars. So a huge change, right? So this change, how can we, how will it influence our day-to-day -day life in business? Yeah, first of, first of all, it will change the landscape of competition and it will change, of course, the experiences and as well the expectations of our customers and clients. Let's dig in a little bit deeper here and go away from the buzzwords like globalization, digitization into more detailed analysis. So let's take the bank industry, for example. 
it's a random example. I will show you other examples later on, but let's take an American bank, Bank of America. They have, of course, a customer who pays for products and services, normal business. Then, of course, they have competitors they always had, like Chase Bank or other banks, Citibank and others. These guys offer us products and services that directly compete with the products and services of this bank. This is usual competition. This has been like that for decades, for hundreds of years. But now something new has come up, and these new things are new competitors, like PayPal, like Apple, Amazon, Google, who bought banking licenses, and they now enter and disrupt this whole industry. Yes, and I spoke to an Apple manager, and he told me, actually, we are not even interested that much in banking industry. It's just the customer experience is so bad, we just have to improve it. We just have to disrupt it, right? So this is kind of the mindset. They change the expectations with their new products and services. They totally disrupt industries. And then it, there is a third layer, and it might be even more interesting, because there are even competitors that do not compete at all with you. How can this be? Let's have a look. These are competitors that I call user experience competitors, UX competitors. They don't even do banking services like Airbnb or Snapchat or Uber or Ola Cars. They don't do banking, but they change the customer's expectations in general. Because if the next generation, they are used to use Snapchat or Insta or other apps, they feel like, why should I go to the bank, like a physical branch, and have this awful experience? They have opening hours. I have to sign things like with a pen on a piece of paper. Can you imagine how old school? And this is kind of a thing that I want to focus on, that this changes even your industry without being direct competitors. And this is true not just for banking. Banking was just one example. But it's true as well for others, uh, as I will show you in a second. And this is kind of changing the way you interact with your customers. Let's say this is the customer in the middle, in the center. Because the customer experience is key for sure. Now, these guys like Apple, Amazon, Google, the pl platform providers, they are very close to the customers. The last thing um, in the evening you have a look at is your smartphone. In the morning, the first thing you look at is your phone again. So you are directly in contact with either Apple or Google or even both, right? So they are very close to the customers. And then in the second layer, these are kind of the platform solutions. They have ecosystems. You enter it once, you sometimes even feel like locked in. Then in the second layer, you have just services. These are specialized services for platforms. Yeah, okay, good services, but not as close to the customer as the platform itself. And then the third layer, the usual bank that we started with, it becomes kind of a commodity. It's just basic services products. They are exchangeable. Sometimes even Google or Apple or other um, tech giants they can come in between the customer and these brands. Yeah? And this is not just true for banking, as I mentioned before, but it's true as well, for example, for car industry. I have a background in strategy consulting. I consulted a lot of German car makers like Daimler, like Volkswagen or Audi or others. And for them, it's the same story. They have their competitors, like General Motors, like others, but then there are new competitors. Again, Apple, Google, if we speak um, autonomous cars that are self-driven. We have Tesla, if we speak electromobility. And again, you have these uh, UX competitors that do not build cars at all, but still they change the way people want to interact with brands. Big, big uh, client of ours. Then you have competitors like O2 or Vodafone. Again, new competitors, Apple, Google, that go in between the client on the one hand and you on the other hand as a corporate. They go in between. And then you have again the user 
experience competitors. And it's not just true for different industries, as I mentioned, but it's true for different markets because you can see the same in, in Europe, in the US, um, or in India. If you take Airtel, for example, Docomo and Vodafone might be competitors. Again, the new competitors are Apple, Google, and you have user experience competitors like Paytm that we mentioned in the beginning, like WhatsApp, Uber, Ola Cars, or others. Right? So to make a long story short, it's about complexity. The complexity has risen in enormously, significantly. Yeah? And how can you deal with this complexity? Yeah, actually, agile methods seem to be quite robust against, com against complexity and seem to be quite well suited to deal with it. So if you have a look at problems in general, there are different kind of problems. Just have a short look. You have so-called simple problems. These are not really problems um, in the way that you cannot solve them. They are more like simple um, challenges with a simple solution pair. Yeah? But then the more interesting part is the differentiation between complicated problems on the one hand and complex problems on the other hand. I guess you, you might know the difference already. I'll just go into this very briefly. Complicated problems, you don't have a solution yet. Of course not. If you had, it wouldn't be a problem at all. But what you have already is the solution path. You already know how to solve, solve this problem. You've done this before several times. It's like in a good waterfall approach. You can go down this road and you know something will come out. It's very well suited for complicated problems, these kind of methods. On the other hand, you have complex problems. They are much more hard to handle. Why? Because the, you do not know the solution yet, for sure, but you don't even know the solution path yet. Plus, the single steps, they might be interlinked. There might be interdependencies between them. Yeah? So it is a, a bit like a network. If you like touch it on the one spot, the whole network is moving and changing. And this is typically this, the case with complex problems that um, are questions about the future that you want to solve. And then there is chaos, but chaos actually, we have some theories about it, uh, actually a lot of theories about it, but we are not really, really able to handle it very well at the moment. So let's focus on the complex ones. The complex problems are the ones that you would face with your corporates and with your um, companies. And for these problems, methods like design thinking um, seem to be very well suited to tackle these kind of problems. Others, other agile methods as well, it's not just design thinking, there are a lot of methods. Let's have a look, there are methods like Lean Startup on top, or Scrum, and even Kanban and Lean, you could see as agile methods. Um, so all in all, from our point of view, it's very important to approach them holistically to have an, like an overview over these kind of methods, to understand the problem and to know which method to use when. This is very important. Yeah? We do not want to create these silos like, oh, I know design thinking, so I only can work with design thinking. Or I'm the scrum guy, so I always um, try to use scrum. You know, it's like a guy with a hammer who only sees nails everywhere because he has the hammer and this is not the right approach. We see it rather like a good dinner where you have several dishes. You know that in India, right? You have several dishes and then in different situations, you might want to use the fork or the spoon or the knife, right? Or sometimes even the three fingers of your right hand. So this is kind of um, our approach to use the method when it's needed. So let's zero in, first of all, into design thinking a bit more. What is design thinking actually? And what is design thinking all about? Do you have any clue? Short answer, it's about babies. No, I'm kidding, it's not. This is just one, one good example, let's say, to explain what design thinking is all about. It's a best practice, it's a real life case um, from Stanford University and the students there had the challenge to come up with an incubator because what you see here is an early born baby and this early born baby is um, lying in an incubator, right? 
So basically, they had the challenge to come up with an incubator like that for a reduced price. And so they said, like, for 10% of the price, please come up with an incubator because it was for uh, Nepal rural areas. Right? There, um, the, the, um, a lot of like early borns are dying, so this was the challenge. And they could have started, let's say, with the technology, with the incubator itself, and go, yeah, okay, we can maybe this rubber ring, we can make out of plastic and make it a bit cheaper. And maybe the glass, we can use some plastic as well, we can import from Far East, um, then it's cheaper, and let's try if you can find some cheaper screws. I am sure you can squeeze out a few percentage points here and there, do some cost cutting, maybe even 10% you can squeeze out, but you cannot go down to 10% of the cost. I'm quite sure about that. So what they did, they tried to be customer or user centric and started with this young baby. I don't know if it's a girl or a boy, what do you think? Is it rather a boy or a girl? You think? Let's you say, think? yeah, let's say it's a boy, I guess it's easier for us. So they started with the basic needs of, of this baby. So what do you think are the basic needs of this baby? Tobias, can you ask the audience, please? Yeah, well, uh, what, are your, uh, what do you think are the basic needs? Do we have a, a, a microphone? But comfort. Comfort, very well. More needs, what else More are needs. basic needs? Warmth. Warmth, very important, because the baby's early born and it's warm. What else? Food. Very good one. Food is a good one. What else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the nearness to to the mother. Yeah, that's a very big one. I actually I always forgot that one. I always thought about warm and food and so on. But then actually it's necessary that the baby is able to listen to the heartbeat of the mother even or the father and hear the voice and feel um, yeah, the near of the mother, it's important because we are social beings. Without that, we are not even able to survive. Very important one. Anything else? Air. Air, very good. And what kind of air do we need here? Oxygen. Yes, fresh air. Very important. <laughs> oxygen, fresh ox oxygen, because the baby has a very weak immune system. It's early born, so like viruses, germs, bacteria, could really, really um, endanger his life. So yeah, and exactly, these are the basic needs. So with these basic needs, they came up and wanted to reduce the cost of the incubator. So what do you think is the usual cost of this incubator? Best guessing. What do you think? How much does an incubator cost? $10,000. Good guess, any other? What do you think? Can you say it again? 15,000. Yeah, very good. We are getting closer. What I learned is that a usual incubator in Western societies costs around about 20,000 bucks. I guess it depends on the equipment, so can be more, can be less. So you were quite close. So the challenge was to, for 10% of the cost for 2,000, come up with a solution with the basic needs of the baby. So what they came up with, the students, is actually this solution for 1% of the cost. So a real disruption. Now you could go, yeah, but wait, Simon, 1% of the cost, it's 200 bucks. To be honest, I can produce a cheaper sleeping bag in India um, as for 200 bucks, right? But it's not just an ordinary sleeping bag. What you see here is actually a technological product. Because you see this orange garment, for example, it's um, nanotech material. I'm not an expert, but I learned that bacteria, germs, viruses cannot stay on this material for a long period of time. Second thing is there's a, hot, uh, there's a wax blade included in the back of the sleeping bag. And the wax blade has um, specific let's say, um, characteristics. So if you heat it in boiling water, it will store, it will keep the warmth and give it away like very steadily for three to four hours. And then it will just drop the temperature. So the father can change the plate after four hours, 
put a new one that is warm again to keep the baby warm. Different than iron, for example, that would be too hot in the beginning and then very, very soon drop the, the temperature. So what I want to say is that there are some high-tech elements included. Yeah, second thing is it's, you can, it's portable, you can take it, you can take the early born to the next hospital that might be hours and hours away in Nepal, or you can take it to, to your work um, on the farm or whatever. Yeah, and the third thing that you see here is a little like signage on, on the back, it's called Embrace. So the students from Stanford, they didn't just find a solution, but they made a startup out of it. They so, solved this problem and they sold this solution like many times and saved many lives. And this is, from my point of view, why it's a good solution. Of course, in our societies, we would maybe go for the left solution because we have the choice, but in Nepal rural areas, you do not choose between the left or the sleeping bag, but you can choose between the sleeping bag or nothing. And in this circumstances, it can be really life-changing, okay? So from my point of view, an amazing example, how when you start customer-centric, user-centric from the needs of this little guy, can come up with great solution. You can even, the baby can even be breastfeeded, breast, breastfeeded here uh, with this solution, which is good for the immune system as well. So on a more abstract level, looking more like a consultant chart, same story, it looks like that. If you start from the desirability and you strictly follow the needs of your users, and then you go into the feasibility, how is it possible to solve the problem technically? You have to have experts on board about nanotech, about the RECs. I'm not an expert, you need experts on this team. And then you think about the viability. How can we sell this um, and how can we make money with it? And if these three come together, then you have the spot for sustainable innovation, right? So a common mistake is in, in our society where I come from is that we are very like, let's say engineering driven. I consulted a lot of car makers as I mentioned before. They are very good engineers. So they start with the feasibility. They say, we have the best diesel engine in the world, right? So let's build some body type around it. And let's say a pickup, we don't care too much. After that, you say like, okay, how much can we, um, what was the price tag for it? Then they say, okay, 70,000 euro, let's say, as an entry price. And then afterwards, they went to the market and see like, okay, wait, what are the two biggest pickup markets in the world, what do you think? Tobias, could you ask the audience, please? What are the two biggest pickup markets in the world? Yeah, what do you think are the two biggest pickup markets in the world? US and China. Yeah, very good. I guess that's true for now. This project is 10 years ago. The two big, biggest markets were US for sure, and then Thailand. Thailand, I was very surprised, I didn't know before. So actually this German car maker who produced the pickup, they produced a car, to be honest, that didn't suit Thailand or the US. Why? For the US market, I exaggerate a bit, but there's one guy sitting in a car, huge pickup on the highway, driving his car, right? Um, whereas in Thailand, you have like 10 people sitting on the pickup, going to a farm, going to a job, maybe a company car, totally different use case, meaning, for the US market, the German car were like not suited, too small, didn't look fancy enough, not, not big enough, not enough chrome. And for the Thai market, it was way too expensive. If you have a look at the Thai market, they use these little cars there and much cheaper, much more hands-on, meaning they did this classical mistake, marketing mistake, just stuck in the middle. Yeah? And in the second iteration, we came in and the first thing that I did is, let's go out there, let's talk to the clients, let's figure out what they really need. Because if you start from the desirability, it's much easier to come up with good products and good services and to sell them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those guys who just um, saying, it's all about the needs, just desirability, it's the only thing that counts, forget about feasibility and viability. Not at all, they are important, but just if you start with the desirability, you make life much easier for yourself in terms of innovation, yeah? Okay. So in the classical project planning, it's a difference to design thinking as well. Classical, this was how my life looked like for four or five years in strategy consulting. You have an analysis phase, a conception phase, and then an implementation. Maybe three months analysis, 
uh, three months conception and uh, two months implementation, pilot international rollout. It worked until it didn't. Why? Because the world is changing so fast that sometimes after three or four months of analysis and then a long conception phase, yeah, the analysis is not true anymore. You start the implementation, but already the world has changed. Already there are new competitors. There's a new app that disrupts your industry. For example, like Skype. We are using Skype right now. One of our clients is from the telecom, German telecom. And Skype started with like 15 people and they disrupted the whole whole landline industry in Germany and I guess in other parts of the world as well. So this can change the world so fast that the analysis is not true anymore. So what we do in design thinking is we go more in a non-linear process. You can go back and forth between different phases as it is needed to deliver the best results for your users. Yeah, and this is okay. There are different phases. I won't go too deep into these. You might know them understand phase where you want to understand the problem behind the problem in the context, observe phase where you really want to see and um, immerse into the culture of your clients. You create a point of view where you close down and you really have one challenge that you want to solve. And then you go wide again. Um, you want to ideate, have a lot of ideas, a lot of different ideas, no boundaries. Afterwards, prototyping, you already have to choose a few of them. And then you test them, you close down again, so to speak converge um, into testing. This is like the usual process of design thinking where you can go back and forth. Plus, you would go through this process like not only once, but at least twice or three times or even more, like in iterations, right? Very important because now in the same project timeline, you have a much steeper learning curve and you are more adaptive or more flexible to adaptive environments. Uh, this is kind of the reason why we're doing this, to deal with complexity. So design thinking has a few core principles. I just sum it up. It's people and experience centric. It does not mean that business and technology are not important. It just means you start with the people and their needs. It's iterative and agile, as we've just seen. And it's very, very okay to fail in early ch stages, to fail early, as long as you fail cheap, and as long as you learn fast. And that's a big culture change. Don't underestimate this, please. Um, in a lot of corporates that I know, failure is not an option at all. If you fail, ooh, bad, right? So this is a big culture change. Same goes for the next three core principles. The one is that prototypes are supposed to lead to results, not so much master plan, meaning you work very hands-on, very early you try to, to make something tangible and to get good feedback, to get good results, to show it to clients very early. Yeah? If you present it to the clients when it's already perfect, it's too late. Yeah? This is kind of the lean startup um, mentality as well. If you launch a product when it's perfect, it's already too late because others might be faster. Yeah? So again, a big culture change you can imagine. Then you have collaborative and cross-functional teams. Big culture change because in a lot of the corporates there are silos. You have marketing, then you have production, then you have might be sales, you have legal, uh, you have purchase. But all of these guys live in their own world, in their own systems, in their own silos. And what we do is we really pick these guys from the different silos, put them together in teams, and let them work together, like hands-on in teamwork. Yeah. And this whole thing can be more playful, more trustful. And this is because we like it to be more playful and trustful. It's my personal purpose as well to, to change the way we work a little bit because I saw that people can get sick and ill if they work in an environment that is not creative, it's not playful, it's not nice. And at the same time, um, empirical studies show that people who, are, who feel free, who feel like in a playful environment, they are much better in terms of uh, performance. They are much more creative much more outcome, much more innovative, meaning, yeah, this is a good thing to create. And this is actually what we want to do. I mean, this is what we do. We transform kind of these industries with these, with these methods. 
So now we talked about the why and the what already a little bit. Uh, let's stick into the how. How can we now combine agile methods? Yeah. So what kind of methods are there again? Design thinking, lean startups come and so on. Again, it's important to have this, let's say, holistic approach. Yeah? To have all of them in your site, and then you decide on the spot, depending on the project, depending on the competitors, depending on the situation, on the context, which methods to use, when and why. So like a general first, um, you know, to get a bit closer to what these methods are about, you could say the design thinking is very, very well suited to understand why the customers want something and what they exactly want. If you really care about the customer experience and the customer needs, design thinking is very well suited to help you with this, to support you. Whereas others are very good um, to answer the question how. How to build and measure, for example. Lean Startup is very good. How to implement Scrum, very, very good. Or even how to improve continuously Kanban and Lean, very well suited. Yeah? So now, if you want to pick some of those guys and bring them together, like I mentioned before, the fork to eat or the spoon or the knife to eat. Sometimes you want to, to use the fork and the knife together, right? So let's say you want to use fork and knife together. So let's have a look how the whole dish is kind of spread over the table. So we approach agile transformation holistically means if you take another grid to organize it, you know this maybe from your studies, right? The old BCG matrix. It's not, it's not only two by two, but you have question marks that are more explorative. For these guys, you don't know yet if they will be successful. You don't know the environment very well. For these guys, design thinking might be really good because you can explore, you can understand on a deeper level. Whereas if you go more to into the direction of rising stars that are already um, yeah, good in terms of growth of their market share and so on, then Lean Startup and even Scrum might be really good because you can already um, uh, deal more with the how, how to, to improve, how to implement and so on. And then the cash cows, if you go more into the direction of the cash cows, meaning products that have a very, very big reach in the market, a big market share, but maybe the growth is not that high anymore, there might be Kanban and Lean Startup might be the right thing just to milk the cow in the best manner and not to spread, to spill too much of the milk, so to speak, to stay in this, in this um, example. Okay, so now if you have a look at this again, I touched already the topic of the, the fork and the knife. How can we bring the fork and the knife together? The design thinking and the scrum, for example. Yeah? First of all, design thinking and scrum, they have something in common that I highlighted already several times. They deliver solutions for complex and adaptive environments. This is the common ground. Both of it are well suited to do so. Let's have a look at design thinking. It develops solutions, yes, for complex um, and adaptive environments. How? With the design sprint that we already learned. With the different steps, understand, observe, point of view, ideation, prototyping, testing. Well done. But the same to deliver solutions for complex and adaptive environments is true for the Scrum. Here you have a little bit different kind of methodology. You have like your sprint, and in the sprint you have your daily scrums, you have in the end a sprint review, you have a sprint retro. So this is kind of um, the, you know, the, the rhythm of a, of a scrum sprint, but in the end, same, you deal with complexity. How can you bring it together now? Okay, in the usual scrum, what we figured out is we, we talked as I, as, um, in the beginning was mentioned, we are all product owners, our own, we are all scrum masters, and we talk to a lot of like expert experts in scrum and scale and safe and whatnot um, on scrum days and did some scrum, did, did some crowdsourcing for the insights. So we figured out actually the development teams, they are quite comfortable, let's say. How is that? I mean, their, their kind of job is to achieve the sprint goal that they committed and to deliver a shippable increment, right? Good, but they are a team. Plus, they have the Scrum Master who really is supposed to back them, to help them out. So from our point of view, the most crucial part where Scrum could need some support 
through other methods is the product owner. Because the product owner, he or she, they have to deal with the stakeholders. And you know, stakeholders can be quite demanding and can be quite diverse in terms of their interests and their lobbyism. Plus, they have to come up with a product vision. It's not an easy thing. What is a good product vision? Which product vision actually suits really the needs of the customers? So we talked to the product owner a little bit more in detail, did interviews, and we came up with um, uh, quite a list of issues and challenges that these product owners have. First of all, sometimes they don't have the power to decide, right? So they feel powerless. The vision is not clear. Their own vision, the vision of the product, the vision um, of the company. Third thing is no time. Yes, of course, because product owners, they have different roles. They are not just product owner for one uh, product, but they might be different. They have like their usual job if it's a metrics organization. So they have a lot on their plate, right? Uh, fourth point is that sometimes there is no agile mindset, not in the company itself, sometimes not even in the product owner, right? They are high level people usually, and maybe they are not like um, usual developers or people who grew up with agile methodology. So the agile mindset sometimes is missing. And they admitted it and said like, yeah, even myself, I'm, I'm new in this field, but now I'm supposed to be a good product owner. The fifth point is the stakeholders, again, they are not aligned often, they have different interests, they are pulling in different directions, and it's not an easy, easy task um, to solve, to find the right balance and to align them really. And the last point, there are too many products often. It's not just one, but they have a lot of services, a lot of products on their plate, so it's, a, it's really a mess. Plus, the main question remains unsolved, what do the customers really need? And how is this poor guy supposed to know this, right? It's not easy. And this is exactly where I think and we think design thinking can help. And we have proved this in several projects that if you build a cross-functional team to create the product vision, not just the product owner himself or herself, but to put some developers to his side, an agile coach, like we are doing this, some stakeholders, and together you come up with a product vision, this already helps a lot. Right? And then there are some methods, let's say, to really go through this process in a structured and, and um, yeah, good way, good manner in a complex environment. And this you can do in, with an explore sprint. So with design thinking sprints, you can, come, uh, you can go to, towards um, a better product vision and backlog. First of all, you would do an explore sprint. This is purely meant to understand better yeah, you do really an explorative sprint, might be a five-day sprint um, where you just went through, uh, go through the context, the problems to try to understand better. And then together you come up with a well-suited product version. And based on this, you still have the, the issue or still have the challenge to come up with a perfect backlog, right? A good product backlog. So a refinement sprint where you really build to learn can help you from our experience. And we did this, for example, with the bank in, in northern Germany and really helped us to, have, to come up with a, with a good backlog. So the product owners felt very comfortable afterwards. They're like, yeah, this is exactly what we needed. And with this backlog then, you can just fill it in into the Scrum methodology, put it into the development sprints and build to ship, right? And this is like a machine. It's working the Scrum. It's like a machine, but you just have to fill in. And if you don't fill in the right things, and the outcome won't be as good as, as you want to have it. Okay. Sometimes then in the development sprints after one, even you might want to add a, a new explorative sprint, depending on um, the situation. If there are new questions are popping up, if something has changed, again, it's all about dealing with complexity, right? So you're flexible to add these guys because now your team is already, has already the mindset to combine agile meth methods. And this is actually one example that we chose to show how you can s build smart interfaces between different agile methods, like in this example, design thinking on the one end and Scrum on the other hand. And this is basically what we do. We want to approach an agile transformation holistically. This is what Launch Labs does. And this is actually our mission as well, to enable experienced companies to act as fast as agile 
um, creative as successful startups, right? And we have learned that you need three pillars, basically. You need to tackle three pillars to do so. First of all, it's about training. We call this learning labs, meaning your, your employees, they need to have the right skills, they need to have the right knowledge in terms of the methods, in terms of the tools, not just methods, tools, but as well in terms of the process. If you want to work with them in designer thinking or Scrum, they need to know something about the process because it's different from the usual thing. But that's not enough. In all our discussions with our clients, what comes out is most important things for the first pillar is the mindset. Mindset is key. If your employees um, do not know, if your stakeholders do not understand how agile me uh, methods work, it's very hard um, to deal with it. So the training pillar, very important, and this is what we do like globally actually, yeah? throughout the US, in Europe, in Asia a lot. Second thing is project support. Yeah, because if you have trained your people in terms of the methods, process, and mindset, of course you want to prove that it works. You need these success stories, these, light, these lighthouses um, that then can be like project marketing internally in your company. So you do agile projects together and you might need some support for this. After a while you can stuff internally because your, your guys are getting there more and more. And the third pillar, not to be underestimated, is the so-called work environment for team work environments. We, in lack of a better title, we call it work environment, but actually there are several things in this pillar. It's not just about the spaces. Spaces are very important. You might see behind me how it looks in the launch labs. Um, so we, our own created spaces that have the purpose to create a purpose-driven design, meaning if you want to have a breakout session, the, the space should suit you. If you want to have a plenary session where you present to 50, 60 people, the space should suit you. And it should be flexible in doing so and be adaptive to your needs, not the other way around. Not like in a usual boardroom, you enter the room and you know exactly, okay, this is for sitting down, drinking coffee and watching PowerPoint. Yeah? So this is not what we mean, but very activating uh, spaces with our own furniture line. Actually, we came up and created our own furniture not because we wanted to do so, but there was nothing on the market that can help you. So we have now high tables, flexible chairs, everything is on wheels, the tables, the desk, the boards. So this is actually um, the, the furniture part. And then on top to space and furniture, there are other parts, for example, like the IT processes. You, know, you have the IT systems in companies and you want to work agile, but sometimes the whole IT system is working against you. Yeah, how many of my clients? Told me, yeah, Simon, it would be great to do so, but we are a bank. We are not uh, allowed to use Dropbox. We are not allowed to use Trello or Asana. We are not allowed to use even G Suite or Teams or whatever. So. You know, it's very hard um, if you do not have IT systems that support agile work to do so. So this is one focus of this pillar as well. And of course, process landscape. You all know this, if you want to go through the process of purchase, it can be very much against an agile mindset and approach. Mm -hmm. To make a long story short, these three pillars, training, projects, space, our work environment should come together from our point of view and our experience to make an agile transformation more successful, more probable to work. Mm -hmm. And we have some experience with this, just very briefly, um, in different methods like design thinking and startup scrum mainly. We are a spin-off of the D school in Stanford and Potsdam, close to Berlin, Germany. Um, for more than 10 years we're doing this now and our team has trained more than 15,000 people and more than 60, 600 design sprints. Alone in India, we helped with our clients Accenture to train more than 65,000 people. 65,000 people. We cannot do this on our own, of course, but we have um, modules that scale the training, train the trainer modules like a snowball system. So yeah, this is um, kind of what we do for more than 10 years now. And we are not just doing this from, from Berlin, but uh, we have 
headquarters in Berlin, Germany, in Basel, Switzerland, in Sofia, Bulgaria, as well as in Bengaluru. Um, yeah, and we are doing these jobs all over the world, from north to south and from west to east. Clients, I touched already a few of them, like Accenture, like Daimler, Siemens, the Telekom, Volkswagen and others, as well as mid-sized companies that are very successful, these so-called hidden champions, NGOs and public institutions a lot. I'm just about to do a project with, um, with um, Germany, like with the government, and they are interested in this methodology as well. Okay, this is it so far from my side. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me over these channels. And please feel free to speak to Tobias directly as well, maybe exchange um, a business card. And um, don't be shy, we would be happy to get in contact with you and to start a conversation. Um, and we're very keen on you know, learning where you are in this process of agile transformation right now with your company and your colleagues. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have a couple of minutes when you have right now questions to me or as well to, to, to Simon. Do we have any questions? Yeah, here in front. Can you bring the microphone? So then he can hear us. So I had a question in terms of the interface between design thinking and agile. Uh, you spoke about the mindset aspect, right? So arguably, when you're doing design thinking, the mindset could be quite different when compared to agile where you focus more on execution. So when you're talking about uh, design thinking within agile, how do you probably tackle that so-called conflicting mindsets? And secondly, from a governance perspective, how do you ensure that governance for design thinking, which technically is best done without governance, can marry into an agile, which is having a very defined scrum uh, team per se? Mm -hmm. um, regarding the first one, it's um, the main question, so to speak, right? How can you bring them together? From my point of view, they are members of the same family. They are not very much different. Why is that? Because if you have a look um, how they originated, so to speak, right? I mean, design thinking was built um, like more or less in Stanford University, in the Hans Plattner Institute, D school, and they brought together the engineers and the IT experts with their mindset and they said like, hey, these guys are very well in terms of like, like analytical brain, analytical part. If we can add some creativity, um, then together it's very powerful. It's like standing on two feet, so to speak. So the origin is, um, it came out of, of IT and engineering, so to speak. Um, plus, there are some core principles that are the same. If I go back to this presentation, uh, in the presentation, to some of the core principles of design thinking, I hope you can see them right now on the screen. Maybe you can uh, play the presentation when it is a little bit bigger here. Like this? Yeah, that's better. So, so you, have, you have different um, of these, um, let's say, core principles of design thinking. And to be honest, um, several of them are very well true as well, for example, for Scrum, right? For example, that you want to go iterative, the second one. For sure, that's Scrum. In Scrum, you go in sprints, you go in iterations. You don't um, do one only after the other, but you can go back and forth, right? Because you have several iterations with retros in between, with reviews and so on. Fail early and cheap, learn fast. That's kind of the main principle as well of Lean Startup. Yeah, in Lean Startup, you want to launch very, very early. You want to fail. You want to just have like a, like a landing page, for example, like Tesla did, right? They just had a landing page, and then if enough people click on this page and want to, to buy this electric car, then you start to build, and then you kind of grow and scale and all these other things, right? Again, prototypes lead to results. You can find this as well in, um, in Lean Startup, that you create MVPs. Um, as well, of course, like in software industry, you want to have prototypes as soon as possible. And the collaborative cross-functional part, you have development teams in Scrum. You don't want to have the silos anymore. Yeah? Explicitly, you want to, to put people together from different backgrounds um, so that you can be um, adaptive, that you can have inspections, that you can have this transparency. 
Yeah. In terms of the playfulness and the trustfulness, I guess, yeah, I guess if you work in Scrum, it already feels different than from usual work. But of course, yeah, in design thinking sessions, sometimes that's even more, it's even more playful and creative and, and people centric. I, I guess that's the part that can design thinking add to the agile family to be a little bit the, the play child, which brings in like this creativity and this like, like fresh eyes and really care about people and, and their, their needs and so on. But all the other things, I guess, are already quite close. And this is what I wanted to highlight, that it's not design thinking versus agile, but I would say it's an agile family. And in this family, there you have different brothers and sisters, like design thinking, like Lean Startup, Scrum, and even Kahneman and Lean that are quite different as well, but still want to be iterative, still say, hey, let's do this step by step in an agile manner. Okay, this regarding the first question. The second question, what I understood is um, that it's hard to implement Agile in government context. Is it true? Was it the question? Government. Government, yes. Yeah, okay, I have experience with on different layers. Um, I worked for this like Bundesministerium, it's called, it's like the Ministry um, of Germany for different, for, um, for, for labor, for um, security yeah, and internal and affairs. Second? Now so I just so do a project second? for like, um, for a country inside of Germany. For all of them, it's very, very Simon? new. They are not very used to, to yeah, work in this yeah. kind of manner. Can you hear me? It was about governance, the question. Governance, how you can steer your team. So what is the question exactly? Yeah, so can we have a microphone again? A microphone again? Sorry, so my question was typically for an agile team, you have a governance in place. So you have your product owner, you have your developer and so on and so forth, you have a team. Um, yeah. But design thinking, very often not, although you have a cross-functional team per se, you typically don't have a governance. You don't have sprint one, sprint two, although it's iterative. You are probably, you get the best results when you're not having a very defined governance per se. So how do you marry those two? If you're gonna have that uh, one within the other, how will you manage the governance? Mm -hmm. Good point, mm -hmm. good point. Um, first of all, I, I would say yes, you have this governance in the Scrum team. Um, what we I wanted to highlight is a bit that this governance sometimes can be a bit overwhelming for the product owner, for example, because the product owner, in theory, it's the perfect person. He or she, they know everything about the customers, they can handle all the stakeholders, they are kind of in this God's view perspective. In real life, we learn it's not true. I remember one PO, it was the CEO of a bank, and he just became this title of being a PO because he was the most powerful guy in this whole bank. And they thought like, okay, we don't want to do anything against him, so he becomes the PO. But he didn't know anything about it, to be honest. So it was very new for him. So what I say is, let's share the governance a little bit in cross-functional teams, even in Scrum, to support this one person who is the PO, for example. Yeah, if we support him via this, for example, product vision team that can work cross-functional, that is self-organized, that is actually following the rules as well of um, like Scrum methodology to be self-reliant, self-organized and so on, and we can help them out. And on the other hand, for design thinking, it's not true that you don't have governance at all. Most of the times, most of the project that I do, um, you have like servant leaders there as well, right? people who would um, like steer the project, who are responsible for the outcome and so on. And then sometimes we have even quite strict project plans where we say like, okay, sprint one, sprint two, sprint three. Of course, you cannot say exactly what is the outcome of each sprint because it's an innovative process. If I knew the outcome already, it wouldn't be innovative. But that you have a sprint with an end and with a, cer with a certain type of outcome, like a prototype, like an MVP, this sometimes is very strict and the product, uh, the project lead, so to speak, often is responsible for this as well. So I guess it's, it's possible to marry them. We did this several times and so far the governmental part worked, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, maybe one last question. Yeah, we have one more. Go for the microphone. First of all, thank you for the, for the uh, 
session. So okay. my question is on this uh, iterative approach in Scrum. I mean, one example I always give my team is like, uh, it's more like a skateboard and car example, right? When the client wants a car in the iterative approach, you don't really build it component by component, but you build a skateboard so that you can show that the client, it can move. Then you add the other components like seats, doors. But in, in, in large scale transformation projects, uh, it is not always technically or practically feasible because you need to launch the market, I mean, launch the product into, into, into market. At the same time, um, I'm facing a challenge on how, how do you really make it iterative, similar to the skateboard example. Mm -hmm. Because the project is so large, and uh, uh, it's not really technically feasible to you know for you to slice it down the requirements into such things. So, is, is there any rule of thumb or any best practice that you 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 would recommend to you know to make sure we are heading in that right iterative mindset direction? Yeah, yes, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. It's a great example: the skateboard versus the car. For people who do not know it, is if you work incremental, so to speak, you would build first a wheel and then the axis, and then, I don't know, the engine, and then the roof, and then the body type, and then in the end, you try to put it together, right? So you, you build all the parts, but you don't start with something that already worked in a more, not incremental, but in an iterative, in an MVP mindset. You would first build a skateboard, this is what your colleague is referring to, meaning you have something that already has like a certain basic function of the car, meaning, carry you from A to B, and then you can build a bicycle, and then you can build a scooter, and then you can build a bike, and then you can build a car. But all of these have this basic function of mobility included. And this is what I would try to do. I, I know what you're, where you're coming from. It's hard in real life projects, in big scale projects, to come up with real functionality. But if you can find in a big scale project some functions that are crucial, try to build them first, try to kind of prototype them, kind of build MVPs just for these functions, not for the whole thing that you want to, to transform. And then you have already test informations about these. I know it's hard. I mean, if you work with banks, for example, there are a lot of regulations. They say like, we cannot just prototype and try it out. If you work with car makers, or with uh, airlines, of course, they say like, hey, we cannot just go out with a prototype because security or safety is so important for us. The brakes have to work. Yes, it's true. In the end, they have to work. But in the beginning, if you are just in an explorative state, you can just prototype and try out experimental um, features, basic functions of your products and services. Um, this is what I would, would say in general. If it's more specific, if you have more specific question to a certain, in a certain industry for a certain project, please feel free to reach out. Maybe we have some some experience regarding this industry and maybe we can share our views and put our heads together. We're always very, very happy to support. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much again. It was a pleasure. I'm a bit, um, a bit sad that I couldn't come to Bangalore myself this time, but I will be there soon, I guess in autumn the next time. Um, and um, yeah, send all my, all my greetings and all my love to India. Yeah. Thank See you, you Simon. Thank Bye. you so much. Namaste. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Simon and Mr. Tobias. You set the perfect example by delivering what exactly the customers who are present here needed by connecting with us through the digital medium. It was an amazing session. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, please, you audience, please give them a huge yeah. round of applause once Thank again. You. And when you have any more questions, I will, I will be here the, the whole day, so just reach out to me. So thank you. <laughs>